Summit asks us two things, operate a safe business and operate, operate a profitable business. Welcome to episode 52 of The Crownsman Show. Today we are joined by Kevin Spence. He is the president of Mainland Construction Materials. And today we will get to dig into the upgrades to a crushing facility, dredging in the Fraser River, and what happens when the big corporation takes over the small family-run business. But before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. Today, we are actually sponsored by Fraser River Pile and Dredge. Fraser River Pile and Dredge, Inc., also known as FRPD, is Canada's largest marine and infrastructure, land foundations, and dredging contractor. FRPD's versatile fleet of cutter suction and trailing suction hopper dredges, spud barges, cranes, dump scows, flat scows, and an extensive list of support equipment is ready to complete all types and sizes of marine and infrastructure, environmental remediation, dredging, and land foundation projects. At FRPD, they are committed to providing customers with innovative and cost-effective solutions through the intelligent use of resources and communities with sustainable and environmentally sound business practices. To find out more, visit frpd.com. We're also sponsored by Whipware. Whipware's photo analysis software systems help industries from mining, quarries, aggregate, forestry, agriculture, coal, and explosives remove the need to use manual sieving techniques. Their technologies have saved clients millions in energy costs, maintenance costs, process optimization, quality control, lost time injuries, equipment downtime, quantitative decisions, and much more. Find out more at whipware.com. We're also sponsored by Lampson. Lampson International is a third generation family owned and operated heavy lift and heavy haul construction company with branch offices located throughout North America, Canada, and Australia. Lampson International offers in conventional crane rental, heavy transportation, project engineering, and customized rigging, steel, and timber mat rental, as well as marine and manufacturing services. They were founded in 1946 by Neil and Billy Jane Lampson. The company is in their 73rd year of doing business. You can find out more at lampsoncrane.com. We're also sponsored by Savannah Equipment. Savannah Equipment supplies new and used mining equipment around the world, from placer to underground to open pit. If you need a trommel, ball mill, and even laboratory or electrical equipment, visit their website at savannahequipment.com. Thousands of items are available and they list more equipment every day. Once again, that is savannahequipment.com, where you will find more equipment every day. We're also sponsored by Ashdown Cal. Sorry, we're also sponsored by Ashdown Capital. Ashdown Capital works with businesses looking to increase or access working capital, purchase equipment for growth, undertake new development, or to invest in real estate. They help their clients every step of the way from, again, real estate finance, working capital finance, equipment finance, and construction and development. You can visit them at ashdowncapital.ca. Well, now let's get on with episode 52, Jared Downey and Kevin Spence. Hello everyone, welcome to The Crownsman Show. I am your host, Jared Downey. Today with me is Kevin Spence. He is the president of Mainland Construction Materials. Kevin, how are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for joining us for round number two, the first one. Uh, we had some technical difficulties, so this is a reshoot. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time to come back in. Well, thanks for inviting me back on, Jared. H how are things? Good. I think all things considered, um, things are going quite well right now. So do you have your, uh, um, we, we can't use the name of what's going on be, because uh, we get censored, um, but considering all the, what, what's happening here, um, is, is your staff and everybody back in the office and operating? Yes, uh, I think it's fair to say that we're very fortunate at Mainland because we were deemed an essential service right from the start. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, we really never shut down. We had some some um, slow times where we had a few people um, curtail their work slightly. And we had a lot of times where people were working from home. But for the most part, we kept uh, full staff on 100% uh, of the time through this uh, difficult time. And now, uh, as of this week, everybody's back in the office. Oh, okay. As of this week, did... Um... Will there be anything that sort of any residual from it, uh, you know, looking at more flexible working from home situations and things like that? Did anything sort of get learned from the situation? 
I think it's fair to say that um, we've learned a lot from the situation. And I think we've learned as well that um, we can do a lot of our the tasks we do, at least certain people can do them from home or from a remote locations. So I think once we get back to a normal office situation, we'll uh, figure out a way to have more people working from home and and more flexibility for our employees, which I think they want. They're looking forward to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, we certainly found it with us. I mean, uh, Gowdy, who pr pretty much runs this whole operation, um, you know, she's been working from home and, uh, you know, we, we haven't really missed a beat from it. Um, so it's, it's pretty interesting what you think, how you think you need to operate and then how it actually ends up being can be two different things. Yeah, we're an old school business, right? So we've yeah. always operated from the office and, you know, people get into the office early here and they work long days. And uh, I think we've just learned that that's kind of the old way of thinking. There's there's a new way to do things. And, uh, and we're going to embrace that once we get through this. And now that everybody's back to the office, we'll start talking about um, work from home programs and, and different things like that. Mm -hmm. I want to talk. Uh, let, let's jump into talking about the uh, the company. Um, you know, I've I've seen I've seen the logo, I've seen the brand around, and but I until I we talked, I really didn't realize the scope of what uh, Mainland was doing. So, can you give uh, can you give that bird's eye view of um, who Mainland is, the ties to Summit, um, the sub companies here in BC? Can you just give that snapshot? Sure. Um... So Mainland Construction Materials, as we're known now, is a company made up of two divisions. We have an aggregate division and an asphalt and paving division. And uh, those were brought together by Summit. Uh, in 2014, Summit from the United States uh, acquired Mainland Sand and Gravel, which was a family-owned business in Vancouver, the, the uh, Mainland area, or, or the uh, Fraser Valley area. And they acquired them in 2014 and ran them under the name uh, Mainland Sand and Gravel. And then I came on board in 2017, and at that time we acquired Wind Van Paving, and they've become, so now, as I said, we have two, um, uh, two divisions running under Mainland Construction Materials. We changed the name in 2018, uh, rebranded, uh, relogoed, and have two, uh, the two divisions running under um, one corporate brand now, and we're owned by Summit, uh, materials out of the U.S. Okay, so were you part of that whole process? The uh, which uh, one? The well, first mainland getting bought, and then um, and then the restruct wind van, and, and that were you were you part of the company already? No, I was um, I was brought over from my other position in 2017, just literally days before they acquired wind van paving. So the ownership of the family ownership of mainland sand and gravel for the most part was looking after the business for summit. And then as that ownership structure stepped down, um, they decided they wanted to bring somebody new in to look after both sides of the business. Cause we were expanding summits uh, is a company that likes growth through expansion and they've done a lot of mm -hmm. growth in the U S and uh, we're the only Canadian entity they own. I see. Uh, I just want to pick up on something you said about growth through expansion. Um, is that, uh, I, I, it's probably a, a bit of a layman question, but is that because by the nature of the business, you're limited to quarries um, where you get your product? So the way to expand inventory is through, is through acquisition as opposed to exploration and developing new quarries. Is that sort of why that set up, it's set up like that? A little bit like that. Aggregates is the foundation of all construction materials companies. And for the most part, all the aggregate companies in North America are well established and the reserves are well established. So mm -hmm. most of the major markets already have good aggregate resources that are owned by somebody. And in order to grow a lot of companies, especially companies like Summit, will acquire aggregate companies first because that's the again the foundation of the growth, and then from there they'll they'll add on, uh, whether it be construction companies or paving companies or uh, ready mix companies. So that's kind of a typical business model, and the the big established companies have all grown that way. Right. So now when you say acquire uh, like a paving company, so once you get it's sort of localized aggregate, and then then you look for companies within that within that area that can essentially that that aggregate can supply 
Yeah, and and uh, a company like Summit has done that numerous locations. I think they have. Uh, we really have 13 business platforms across North America, with one being in Canada, which is the mainland mm. one. And most of them have grown through the aggregate. There's other opportunity where some have been construction companies first, but aggregates. Right. All uh, all of the construction world needs aggregates. So if you are a strong aggregate company, you have a chance to become a strong ready mix company or a strong construction company as well. I, I'm just going to quickly say to the audience because um, I went on the Summit website and it's it's pretty neat. There's a whole map and you can filter out all the locations that Summit has. I think there's a whole bunch of quarries along the Mississippi. I think it's Mississippi. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. Yep. Yeah, and it's it's quite neat how they've got it all set up so you can follow it. Um, but that leads me to a question um, that because you are the only, you're sort of the parent company in Canada. So you're the president of mainland. Um, how does that management structure work? You know, uh, with, with you doing the operations here in Canada, but then it's it's owned by a, a much larger company over that's got multiple locations, similar operations. Sorry, <clears throat> similar operations across the U.S. and Canada. Summit operates a very unique model, and it's very different than a lot of the large corporations. Summit operates in a very decentralized model. They allow, when they acquire a company like Mainland, they allow them or want them to keep their, their name. And the first company they acquire is always the platform company. So they acquired Mainland Sand and Gravel, and that's now the platform company. We have changed the name to Mainland Construction Materials, but it's still a Mainland company. And we operate completely, for the most part, independent of mm. Summit's direction. With you know, We have uh, financial platforms and some softwares uh, or software that we utilize across uh, all the company, but for the most part, the decisions are made right here locally. And for the and Summit's you know mantra to us is they want us to you know operate a very safe business and a profitable business. But the decisions on how that's done mm. uh, are done locally. Let's talk about the local because you've got a couple of quarries. Um, you've got uh, Sumas and the Cox Quarry. Um, let, let's. Which one didn't one of them have a major upgrade, like a like a multi million dollar upgrade recently? Yep. So we have uh, we operate two quarries on Sumas Mountain. Uh, the Cox Quarry is on the water side, the Fraser River side, and the Jameson Quarry is on the Number One Highway side. So oh, the opposite, Jameson Quarry. Yeah, opposite sides of the mountain. Uh, the Cox Quarry in 2019, um, we built a new crushing facility there, a 35 million dollar crushing facility. And also in 2019, a new uh, $5 million barge loadout. So we've spent $40 million at the Cox Quarry, and that's increased its production from around 600 tons per hour to over 2,100 tons per hour. And that oh, wow. was done to, uh, to service the market. And so it's a, we have a unique operation here in where uh, the Jameson Quarry, which is on the south side of Sumas Mountain, serves the market by truck. And the Cox Quarry serves like 98% of its volume is done by. Uh, barge and those barges deliver to our five depots in the city. So the barge delivers to the depot or job job direct sometimes, but for the most part, it's to uh, to the depots and from there the customers can pick up. So what that does for us and for the uh, for the market as a whole, it keeps a lot of trucks off the road. Yeah, does so is that was that part of the mainland sand and gravel acquisition? Were those two quarries part of that? Yes, yeah, those two quarries were, were owned by uh, the Carlson family and run under mainland sand and gravel and were acquired by Summit. So were you, were you, were you were on then during the, the time though the expansion took place, is that right? Yes, yeah, I came in on 20, in 2017. Can you just walk us through that process? I mean, I, yeah, I think you know a little bit of my background, you know, the Savannah equipment, used mining equipment and that sort of thing. So obviously upgrades and that always tweak my interest just on a personal level. Um, can you walk us through the process of, a, of, because you're not putting in something new in place, you're, you're upgrading. Um, can you walk us through that process of, of such a major upgrade? Well, I'm, obviously keeping operations going. So it must have been quite uh, an operation to do that upgrade. Um, so just to correct you, yes, we actually put in a brand new crushing facility. So what had oh. happened was um, the Carlson family, uh, the business was run by Ted and Brent Carlson. And years ago, probably a decade ago, um, they already realized that 
that quarry with its with its reserves. Um, there's, we have over 400 acres of land there, and the the size mm. of that reserve is enormous. And they realize that sometime in the future they would need to put in a larger crushing facility to meet the needs of Vancouver. Um, so what they did at that time, I think it was about a decade ago, they bought a gyratory crusher, uh, a large 54 inch by 74 inch gyratory crusher. And uh, it was a used one, but gyratory crushers last a, a very long time. So they bought it in the expectation that sometime in the future they were going to expand that, uh, expand mm. the, the plant, the crushing facility. So over the past probably five or six years, uh, under Summit's guidance, there was a number of designs that were done um, for a new plant. And finally in 2019, with board approval, they gave us the money to build a new plant. And we hired Superior Industries out of Minnesota, um, who have a, a Canadian arm as well. And they mm. came in and we built the new plant right at the base of the quarry mountain, where the old plant was further away. But as the quarry moved back, um, the plant became further from the face. So they built the new plant right under the face. And uh, that plant is now good for the next 20 or 30 years. And it will service, uh, do a good job servicing the, um, the market. And as well, uh, it's much more cost effective than the old plant. So we're pretty happy with it. So does that, that, does that have to directly tie in with the barge? Was that all those upgrades were done at the same time? Because obviously increased capacity, now you have to be able to increase your ability to, to move it out. Is that right? Yeah, so we built the new plant in early 2019 and the barge loadout was only completed later after the barge or after the plant was completed. So we completed the plant first and then the barge loadout. So now, now the Jameson quarry though, that goes, how does that, how does that one get delivered? You said that's all along the highway, that's, that's road? Yep, that's truck delivery. So um, we have a, a fleet of trucks, not our, not our own trucks, but independent truckers that we that we hire to come to the uh, Jameson Quarry. Uh, we load them and they uh, scale out and then haul to the customer's job sites. So they, I mean, really when you look at it, um, most of our jobs that are done in the, in the core of Vancouver are done through the depots uh, from Cox and most of the stuff that's kind of from Langley out to the valley is done by truck. I mean, there is some oh, overlap. Oh, I see. But yeah, there's, there is some overlap, but, but that's generally how it runs. Well, I thank you for that because we're down in New, New Westminster, so that'd probably be a lot of trucks if you were doing it the other way around. <laughs> yeah, I think each barge eliminates 100 trucks off the road, so it, it's a huge amount oh, of Oh, is it that much? Wow. And we all know how the number one highway in Vancouver is is at capacity much of the day, so it, it really helps with uh, reducing trucks <laughs> on the road. It, it used to be. <laughs> I, I, I ride my bike on there now because um, it's so peaceful. Uh, at some times of the day, it's a little, a little scary. Um, I want to go. I want to go. Just, I, I know you touched on a little bit, but you know, you're in an interesting position, and there's going to be a lot of people that watch the show um, that uh, are in a similar. They're in a similar uh, place as you are personally, and or. Uh, a company might be looking at them. They're talking an acquisition, uh, talking about an acquisition, and I just want to go a little bit more um, into, you know, how do you, how do you operate um, when you're you're operating a company independently, but you also have to to answer to a large. I mean, you have to get your numbers right. You know, it has to be safety and everything like that. Um, how do you operate that? Or well, approach it, I should you say. Know, and, and it is interesting. I mean, when Summit came knocking on my door to see if I'd want to join, I mean, I had worked for another large um, construction company in Canada for 21 years. So it's always a difficult change mm. to make. But that was one of the big selling features to me. I had, you know, from the company I had worked from, which was a, a great company, uh, you know, worldwide company, they had, they had very much centralized their business. And the opportunity to have the independence to make the decisions locally was a, was a huge um, attraction to mm. me. So we, I mean, for the most part, like I said earlier, Summit asked us two things, operate a safe business and operate, operate a profitable business. They mm. have resources that are at our disposal when we need them. If we are, like when we built the new plant, uh, Summit was heavily involved. They had experts from all across their other operations come in and help us design the plant and how it should look and how it should operate and, you know, and, and all the intricate parts of the plant. 
And they do that for everything. I mean, if we need something, it's more of a pull system than a push. A lot of mm. big companies like to centralize, so they'll push down their, you know, push down their systems and push down their opinions. Where here, it's more of a pull system. They Summit has everything we need, and whenever we feel we're overwhelmed or we want some input, we just we call and they they supply that for us. Do you think now is that? I mean, obviously you're you're there with the company, so so you like that system. What is the what is the direct advantage to that? Is it a specific advantage in the sand and gravel aggregate business, um, or or is that, or do you think that's a, a system that more companies should adopt that sort of outlook? My personal opinion is more companies should adopt it, but that's because that's where I work and that's what I like. I mean, everybody has their <laughs> own opinion on how they how they'd like to, you know, what kind of company they'd work in, and I've worked in both sides, but. Um, I, I really like I really like the idea of, um, and especially because we're owned by a U.S. company, so that could be a deterrent for some people coming to work for us. But mm. when we explain how we operate, it's uh, it, it puts people at ease to know that you know we're really truly still a Canadian company because we're locally owned. As far as um, the resources we use, we we make decisions on where we want to buy our supplies from. We make decisions on who we want to hire. And Summit just um, helps us. Okay. Um, this is see. This is why Gaudi operates because she can send us little little messages when we need to make adjustments. Um, <laughs> um, well, during this interview as well, she's been rewiring my you know to keep my computer charged, and uh, so thank you. Shout out to Gaudi. Um, the where uh, oh I wanted to ask you about because you, you said you'd you'd been in the business before you you'd come across from one company in a very similar industry or in the same industry. Um, again, it's a bit of a layman question, but I, I do find when I ask this, I get some very interesting answers. Um, how much of what you learned, uh, positive or, or negative, uh, did you bring with you to? to be in the position you're in managing a company, but also operating in the industry itself? Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting question because you, you, as you go through your career, um, you pick up different things and, and, and you learn different things. And that's what des, design decides, or that's how you decide how you're going to manage your business. So, um, I was fortunate enough, uh, in my previous life to work in a number of locations. I, I worked in uh, all the provinces in Western Canada. Actually, I lived in Winnipeg, I lived in Saskatoon, I lived in Edmonton, and I've, I've lived in BC before. And through the learnings and the people you meet, you build your management structure and style around that. And then when you, I think what Summit looked for is they were looking for somebody with a, you know, a wide breadth of experience uh, in the construction mm. materials industry, and they wanted somebody to come across that would. Um, that would bring that knowledge because there is some benefits to a large corporation. Um, large corporations give you access to capital, which is very important. Um, and uh, things like that. And so they wanted to make sure that I understood the benefit of that and uh, could bring that part of my knowledge into what I'm doing with Summit and for Summit here. Because they, mm -hmm. they need you to operate independently. If, if I couldn't do that or we as a group couldn't do that, we wouldn't succeed with Summit. What's, uh, you know, I want to go back to another thing is, um, you know, you talked about um, when the acquisition of WinVan. Um, so that was, you, you were not, you were not with the company when they acquired WinVan. Is that right? Actually, I joined, I think the day or two before the acquisition was finalized. Oh, I see. Okay. Per perfect. <laughs> so what was, I mean, that, Again, I come from a small business background. Um, I've, I've never actually worked for a large a large organization. Um, so, what what is that like when I mean WinVan? From what I know, um, it was a, a pr very well established company as well. What is that like? Um, you know, I, I even from the managers of the company right down to the to the uh, the operational employees. Um, what's that like and how do you approach that that merger of I mean essentially merger of company cultures? Well, it's difficult because there's no correct way to do it. I mean, there's always the what you think is the correct way and then once you go through it, it, uh, it doesn't always mm. come out the way you want it to and I mean 
let's be honest, uh, people that are work for a family owned business, probably there's a number of them that enjoy the family owned, working for a family business. So when right. the family decides to sell that business, there is some people that are going to be upset with that. And uh, so our job was to go in, um, bring a level of comfort for them that we were still going to operate, you know, independently from the, from a, from what most people would see as a corporate structure, but we didn't want to tell them that things wouldn't change because things change. I mean, when a company right. bought up, yeah. things change, reporting lines change, things that you report on change. Probably there's more financial requirements um, with a new, uh, with a corporate structure. So those kind of things all had to change. And, and you know what, there's, there's always some uh, downfall when you acquire and there's some people decide to leave and, and mm -hmm. some people, some people eventually can't hack it and, and leave or they, or, you know, we have to help them out uh, finding a new career path. But at the end of the day, I mean, our job is to try and make people want to work for us because times are changing and uh, we need to be a more progressive company where people want to join our group. Right. Is it, does the, uh, does it come down to, you said about that, that idea of more of a pull instead of a push and, and it, it interests me, uh, and I know I've circled back to it a couple times already, but it interests me because um, companies really do develop their own cultures. And you said when you, you can't come in, it's sort of you have, there's, a, there's almost like a playbook that you're going to go by, but then you need to rewrite that playbook um, as you go. Does, does that approach by Summit, um, d is that a big help? Um, like, uh, and I'll ask it a different way too. Have you, in, in another company, have you seen where it's done the opposite way and, and, it, and it really has a, it sl slows that sort of merger process? Um, Summit has developed a playbook and they hand us that playbook prior to acquisition. And then we, you know, change that playbook for how we feel would be better suited, suited to, to, uh, acquire the company. So it's, it's a playbook that that's not written in stone. Um, but each company is different. And I mean, we've had the, you know, the, the benefit of acquiring one company and we saw how that went. Um, mm -hmm. we hopefully will acquire more companies in the future and I hopefully we'll do a better job the next time. The things that worked, we'll, uh, we'll do them the same and the things that weren't so successful, we'll change them up. Right. Um, I want to go into just I want to go to sorry I just got to find my place here Kevin I I uh, I've jumped around a few on on our so, so I I pulled in um, a couple different topics um, I wanted to go into uh, this is a little more of a technical it's just a side shoot because I thought it was interesting and and actually they are they're one of the sponsors on the show as well. Um, is uh, Fraser River Pile and Dredge, um, Tino Soli, and it's a company Mainland works with. And I, I wanted to talk um, a little bit about that because what happened, I know this is a reshoot of the, so the, you've heard it, but the audience hasn't heard it. Um, I, was walking, I was walking with my wife along, along the river and I saw this sign, no dredging. And I just thought, who, and I, I was thinking it from a, a, from a gold dredge perspective and I was thinking, who in the world is wanting to dredge in this area? There's no way. Why do they even need a sign? And I actually said it to my wife. You were, we did our first interview the next day or the next week. And <laughs> you started telling me about the dredging. So can you talk a little bit about what that is all about along the Fraser River? Sure. So let's, uh, let's back up a little bit. I mentioned that we had five uh, depots. So we have mm -hmm. uh, right. a number five road depot, which is in Richmond uh, near Steveston. We have a uh, number six road depot, which is um, uh, on the Fraser River, just on the south shore across from Mitchell Island. We have the Timberland Depot, which is on the south shore of Fraser River again, across from New West. We have the Port Kells Depot, which is just in the north tip of Langley here. And then we have the New West facility, which is Wind Van's office, which is also a depot. So there's five depots that we uh, operate. And all those depots, like I said, take material from Cox and put them up in piles and sell to the customer. We also receive dredge sand at a number at a couple of our depots. So what what Fraser River Pile and Dredge does uh, for actually for Vancouver and and for us is they dredge a portion of the Fraser River to make sure it 
remains open as a navigable, navigable channel for ships and other things. So they don't go all the way up to Fraser, obviously, but they do stay in the Vancouver area. And they, what they do is they'll, they'll uh, uh, test for high, high points where sand is building up and they'll right. dredge, dredge that sand out. I mean, that sand flows. The river is a, is a live system where sand is continually flowing from the mountains through to the ocean. But sometimes it builds up sandbars and that can uh, uh, hinder ships and barges moving up and down the river. So they will find those high points and dredge them and take that sand and pump it into our, onto our depot on land. We'll let that material sit for a, a length of time to drain out the water, which drains back into the, into the river. And then that sand will sell into the market as preload sand. So it's a really uh, interesting relationship we have with them. Uh, we work with them to sell the sand and to open up locations for them to pump the fresh sand. And all that does is keep the waters open so that people can, uh, or industry can move up and down the river. So when you say that, Phil, is that uh, like over long, like, um, wow, no, I'm, now I'm, really drawing a break over along marine there where they're doing new development and things like that they they fill that in when it's all sort of that bog uh that too but uh preload is like if you're in the richmond area especially you'll notice mm. that they uh they pile the sand up 30 40 feet high on new properties let it sit yeah and compress the soil and then they'll remove that sand and they'll do the new the new build on top of the the new uh the ground after they've removed the uh the sand so it's just to compress the the, the soil underneath to build oh, okay. new developments on top of. Just for my own curiosity, do they then reuse that? So does yep. that get, yeah. Yeah, that sand that comes off there goes to the next site and, and it'll keep moving around the market until it eventually finds its final home. Because every right. time you do a preload, some of that material gets compressed and uh, so you lose some of that sand. Yeah, it, it must just be the way my brain is wired. I find that kind of stuff really interesting. Yeah, it's a unique, um, it's a u a unique you know, circle where the sand uh, comes out of the river, goes to the land, and then eventually uh, disappears, and, and more keeps coming. So it's, uh, it's a unique way to keep the, the waterways open for us. And nobody is gold mining along the banks of the Fraser River in New West or Burnaby, Vancouver. Mining is done by... Uh, <laughs> by uh, Fun prospectors. There's not a lot there left anymore. No. Um, okay. I want to, uh, as, as we're sort of wrapping up the the interview, um, there's a couple of things that, that came out new. Um, I think you're is is Summit uh, is Summit looking at a, getting a new CEO? You we just chatted before, and I think there there's some sort of shift um, at the CEO level. Yeah, just announced. Um, so uh, Tom Hill was our CEO. He started the company uh, 11 years ago and uh, took the company public and remained as the CEO for the, for the last 11 years. Done a fantastic job um, building this company up and he is now retiring. So um, announcement was just made. Uh, Tom will be retiring and a new CEO will be coming in. And uh, so I guess, you know, it's... I don't expect things to change. I mean, we all have our job to do and our, mm -hmm. our businesses to run, but it still was, uh, it's, it was still uh, sad news because Tom's a fantastic leader and uh, he's going to stay on in some capacity, I'm sure, but um, we're going to miss, uh, miss his leadership and uh, look forward to the new person. What do you see um, someone, I mean, and I've, I, I did a little bit of research on Summit and Mainland, and you know, we, you and I have discussed your background. And, and what do you see um, as the what sets apart um, leaders that that allows them to, you know, something like you know, meeting someone like Tom or, or yourself. Um, of course, it's good, it's a little bit strange to sit here and talk about yourself. So I'll 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 highlight Tom. What do you see from a leader like that? Um, that makes him so effective um, at building up a company. I mean, 11 years to build up Summit, that's, I mean, that's incredible. It really is. So what do you see that, that sort of the makeup of someone like that? Tom is a fantastic people person. Like he is mm -hmm. one of those people that you feel like you can talk to about anything. Uh, great listener and, um, and great advisor. Um, just, you know, it's really unique to have somebody in his position that listens as well as he does and also advises as well as he does. So that's the, those are the two traits that, um, 
that made Summit what they are. And I'm, and I'm sure the, the new person coming in is going to, you know, the, the board that has chosen the new person is going to have the same kind of traits because that's how this company was built. And I expect that's the, how the company will continue to run. Mm -hmm. I had, you, you said something earlier about that you'd lived in all, all these places moving around. Um, so the one question I was afraid to ask who you root for when it comes to hockey, um, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a Canucks fan, so. Well, I grew up in Winnipeg uh, as a young oh, no. child, so I'm, I guess I'm a Jets <laughs> fan still. So. Um, so, but the, the more important question is, for, for you moving around, I mean, there's a lot of people that wouldn't do that. Um, and it just, you know, w was that a conscious decision uh, that you decided that that was, was a, a, a value add that you wanted to bring? Or, or did you just really not mind all the moving around? I mean, some people would just hate that. Yeah, and I think I think good businesses are built up from both. I think uh, I was one of those people that uh, growing up in Winnipeg decided that, hey, if I get a chance to move, I'm going to move. And mm -hmm. so I moved, I think I moved seven times in my career. And other people like to stay where they are. I think there's a benefit to both. I think when you have somebody that comes from another operation that's moved a lot, you see a lot of different things and you can bring that um, expertise into a business. And the local people that have lived and worked in one market for a long time bring that expertise of knowing the market mm -hmm. really, really well. So if you right. have a company that's made up of both, I think you're, that's the best of both worlds for sure. What's the next step as we wrap up the interview? You know, someone watching this, um, what, what is the goal of, of Mainland um, over the next, you know, five years um, in, in Canada? I think... Uh, mainland and, and which is also summits uh, is to grow. I mean, I think we want to grow the business. We want to grow through uh, uh, through expansion into uh, acquisition. If you know if the right acquisition comes along, we'll definitely look at that. We also just want to uh, you know stabilize our business platform. And uh, you know, Windvan has now been part of our group for three years. We still got a little bit of work to do uh, integrating the, the the two companies together, Mainland and Windvan. So. And I think um, growth through people is the big one for us. We need to find the right people, find mm. people that want to be part of this uh, this growth, and uh, and hire the right people because the the people's needs and, and and desires in work in their work life balance are changing. And if we don't change with them, we're not going to have anybody working in our industry because, as you know, construction industry is. Uh, is historically been uh, long hours and uh, long days. And I think people nowadays are looking more towards a, a balance in their life where they maybe work more regular hours. And uh, even, the, even the seasonality of construction gets to be very difficult. People want to know they're mm -hmm. employed. People want to work eight hours. A lot of people want to work six or eight hours a day all year round, not 10 hours a day in the summer and then be laid off in the winter. So there's a number of changes that have to come to yeah. the construction industry. And we want to be a leader. It's uh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. Um, is it, you've been in the career, you, you've, you've been in the business a lot of time. Is it, is it more challenging though? I, I'm one of these people, uh, sometimes I like to play the devil's advocate. I, I had, um, you know, I, I, I still consider myself, I, I still feel fairly young, but see people, I, I find now I'm in this age group where people start making comments about like the 20 year olds. And I, I'm, I guess, I don't actually consider myself an overly positive person, but I, I also look at the, the next generation coming up and they have all this technology that they've, they've actually grown up with, so there's not really a, as much of a training process. They can just adapt so quick to it. Um, and there's, there's also a real, there's a lot of hunger for knowledge and things like that. Do you find it harder to... to, to um, find young people that want to get into the industry or, or, or is it much different now? I mean, I don't know if it's harder. I think we just have to change the industry. I mean, the industry mm. is, is, is an old school business. I mean, it's, it's run the same way a long time. So, I mean, people want to do the work. People want a good paying job. People want good benefits and, and uh, you know, a good pension plan from the company they work for. So all those things, come into the business. There's always going to be some people that are, that want to be in the tech business and want to be in the, you know, they want to be uh, influencers and all those things. But, you know, we have to find the people and, and, and uh, bring the people onto ours and then change our business, how we operate our business. So people feel that we're, uh, we're doing things in a way that, that make them want to stay. So it's, it's just change. I mean, we have to be accepting yeah. of change. Yeah. 
Kevin, thank you for com- thank you for coming on the show. I, I really do appreciate it again, um, especially coming on and doing doing it again. And it's you know um, over the past couple of years, I've had to do this a couple of times where we've had to do a reshoot, um, and it's it's always a, a different conversation, of course. Um, you know, and I but I do appreciate you coming on. It's it's interesting to see your company. Um, you know, I'll, I'll put in a quick quick word that uh, the new CEO. Um, hopefully you enjoyed your experience. Maybe we can get, uh, maybe we can get Summit on to talk maybe over the next year or so. And as the, as your company continues to expand and as they do, that'd be an interesting discussion to have. Um, but I, I really appreciate you taking the time to join the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. Okay. That is the Crownsman show for the day. Um, you should check out, um, mainland construction materials um, and their their sub companies you should check out summit especially if you're wanting to get into the industry it's it's a very interesting business um, and and they're doing a lot of good things so thank you for watching everybody make sure to subscribe follow share comment even if it's not positive we, we always need feedback to make the show better um, because as Kevin said, we, we need to change, we need to adapt. So we can always do better for you, the audience. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. We will see you on the next episode of The Crownsman Show. Thank you so much for watching. And please remember to subscribe and follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook. If you would like to help support the production of the show, please head on over to crownsman.com forward slash donations, where you will find two options, the five buck monthly subscription option and the support heavy industry one time donation option. Again, that's crownsman.com forward slash donations. Thank you so much for your support and we will see you on the next episode.